Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the second session. So the session is Admixture in Other Animals and Plants. Um, and our first speaker is Janet Tung, and she's going to talk about uh, population structure and admixture in baboons. Okay. Oh, I, I didn't do anything yet, so you don't have to, you don't have to clap. <laughs> Welcome back from lunch. Um, it's exciting to me to be able to kick off this session on placing uh, admixture in, in humans and our close relatives in context um, through comparison and analysis of other species. This is a role I'm very comfortable playing. I've spent my whole career studying non-human primates, and of course one of the purposes of primatology as a discipline is to hold up a mirror to our own species to understand both what makes us unique and what makes us different. Um, the study of admixture is a great example of how that kind of dynamic can work. Um, our understanding of the history of our lineage is very different than it was uh, 15 years ago before the publication of the Neanderthal genome. We now have uh, changed our mental images of human evolution and divergence from cleanly separating branching trees to something that looks much bushier with multiple episodes of interspecific gene flow between divergent lineages. Even as that has revolutionized our understanding of our own origins, though, it's actually brought us much closer to what primatologists have understood about other closely related primates for some time. Um, examples of historical admixture have now been reported for a number of closely related primate clades, including vervet monkeys, chimpanzees, and bonobos, and my favorite radiation, um, that of the sub-Saharan and Arabian baboons. One of the special things about the baboons that you might notice is not only have I drawn blue uh, lines connecting different species, which represent cases of inferred ancient admixture, but also red lines, which correspond to episodes of ongoing gene flow that we're able to study in extant primates today. And these are observations that are made by primatologists in the field. So there is no question that these animals are actually interbreeding and producing offspring with one another. This is actually very common among um, extant primates. Field observations lead to estimates of about 30% of old world monkeys and, and around a similar estimate for new world monkeys and apes of ongoing extant gene flow between groups that are commonly recognized as species. The ongoing episodes of uh, gene flow mean that we're able to couple genetic data with phenotypic and demographic and ecological data to understand something about the causes and consequences of this type of interspecific exchange. Um, in baboons alone, uh, there are extensive studies in the field at multiple primate hybrid zones, including between Hamadryas baboons and Anubis baboons in Ethiopia, two closely re related species of what are often called the northern clade of baboons, between Kinda baboons and Chakma baboons in Zambia, and in the hybrid zone that I'll spend the rest of my talk telling you about today, between yellow baboons and Anubis baboons, on the long border between these species, including near where um, I've been conducting field research for most of my career in Kenya. And these are just examples of what the um, ancestral or the parent taxa look like. Those are, that's a male Anubis baboon um, in Lake Nakuru, Kenya, and that is a male yellow baboon um, to the east in this sort of uh, reddish orangish range. The reason this is such an exciting hybrid zone to study is because um, it happens to be located coincident with where the Ambicelli Baboon Research Project has been studying individually recognized wild baboons um, for now uh, 51 years of continuous data collection. And what I mean by that is that individually recognized animals, now up to nine generations of them, are followed on a near daily basis in Ambicelli where we collect day-to-day -day information on their social relationships with one another, their demography, their life history, the ecological circumstances they face, what they eat, and also complementary biological samples that allow us to look at parasite loads, uh, microbiome composition, steroid hormone levels, and of course genetic and genomic um, data. I've been fortunate enough to work on Ambicelli through a long-term collaboration with um, these women up on the top right side of your screen. Um, Susan Alberts, who's at Duke University, Beth Archie at the University of Notre Dame in the States, uh, and Jean Altman, who founded this project in 1971 with her husband, Stuart Altman. Um, and much of the data that I'll be talking about today comes from this dedicated and highly professional team um, of Kenyan staff, including some of whom have been studying baboons in the wild um, for over 40 years now. 
One of the things that's interesting about this particular population is at the outset of the long-term study in 1971, Jean and Stewart wrote in their classical text, Baboon Ecology, that there seemed to be no disagreement, that the baboons that they found in the Amboseli Basin of Kenya, this is right near the Kenya-Tanzania border, should be classified as yellow or papiocynocephalus baboons. Fast forward a little bit in time, and in the early 80s, some strangers appeared in the population, individuals who clearly looked phenotypically different from the animals who had been residing there um, uh, earlier in time. Um, and this was reported by uh, Jean and her student, Amy Samuels, in this paper in 1986. And of course, these were Anubis baboon males, or Anubis-like baboon males, who they saw come into the basin, integrate into the existing social groups, and successfully leave offspring behind. This has changed the landscape of the population over time, and morphological and early microsatellite data sets suggested that the population has uh, become increasingly Anubis in the uh, 40 years since those first observations occurred. Recently, my graduate students, Taras Vilgelis and Ariel Fogel, have helped flesh out this picture by complementing the phenotypic and morphological data with genome-wide resequencing data. Most of this is low coverage, um, but it's whole genome resequencing from almost 450 known individuals in the Amboseli population. Um, and then for context, I'm showing you um, genomic data from neighboring populations, both in sort of the Anubis range in Kenya and also down into Tanzania and uh, slightly to the east in Kenya, where you can find individuals that are mostly unadmixed yellow baboons. Um, in each of these plots here, they're linked to the geographic location from which the samples came. Each line shows about 100 megabases of chromosome 1, and it's colored by inferred local ancestry so that the um, green lines show locations that are homozygous Anubis, uh, orange lines show heterozygous local ancestry, and yellow lines show uh, homozygous, uh, sorry, yellow lines show homozygous yellow ancestry. Um, this is only a subset of our data, just for, for you know, spacing and size reasons, but I think it's probably very easy to tell that Amboseli is a much more heterogeneously composed population than ones even relatively close by around it. And in fact, just for um, your, your information, there is no major mountain range or river or anything like that that creates a physical barrier between um, the ranges of, of these two species. Okay. So the genomic data tell us one thing that we already knew from the previous morphological and microsatellite data sets, which is that the composition of our population has been changing over time. So on the y-axis here, you see mean genome-wide Anubis ancestry. On the x-axis, individuals sampled in every year that the population has been studied. They were living in the population during that year. You can see that mean genome-wide Anubis ancestry has grown over the last few decades, and this has been driven primarily by influx from immigrant Anubis and Anubis-like males. These tend to be more Anubis-like than the individuals who are born within the population. Um, it also told us something that we didn't know about the population, and as a reminder, that, that book published um, in the 1960s said, well, it's clear that everything living here is a yellow baboon. It turns out that's not the case, and in fact, we find that even for individuals that were born before the recent influx of Anubis ancestry into the population, or those individuals who have no known Anubis or Anubis-like ancestors in their pedigree, they also contain a substantial amount of Anubis ancestry in their genome. You can see that here, where the kind of intercept goes to the left. Basically, everyone in our population is hybrid, and they are descendants of, perhaps echoing some of the things we heard this morning, something that must have been a fairly complex series of um, episodes of gene flow, including those that we date back uh, at least hundreds uh, to thousands of generations, as well as the influx in the recent past that has been subject to direct observation. The phenotypic data give us some clues about why this increase has happened so quickly. We know from previous analyses, for example, that Anubis-like individuals in this population tend to reach reproductive maturation earlier, so females hit menarche earlier. Males, which are the dispersing sex in this, in actually both parent species, also disperse from their natal populations earlier. We know that male Anubis-like baboons tend to experience um, a, a slight advantage when competing for mates relative to their yellow-like counterparts. So females and males who are co-resident in the same group during a period of time when a female is ovulating are more likely to end up mating with more Anubis-like males than more yellow-like males. And similarly, um, we know that both Anubis-like females and Anubis-like males are more likely to engage in close affiliative social relationships with the opposite sex, which is a phenotype that we know predicts long lifespan in this population, so it's a fitness-related phenotype. 
So all of these observations raise a natural question, um, which is uh, why these two species don't simply collapse into one large hybrid swarm. In fact, we already know from our genetic data that you don't have to go very far in either direction before you run into relatively admixed individuals of each parent species. So to ask that question, we took some inspiration from work that had been done to study selection on introgression from archaic hominins into the ancestors of modern humans. And I'll walk through three of the tests that we did inspired by that work in brief. So in each of these cases, I'm going to show you a result. Um, in one case, it describes what has been um, uh, described in the literature for Neanderthal introgression into modern humans. In the other case, um, the parallel analysis for the baboons, where in this case, the man minor parent ancestry is Anubis baboon entering into a majority yellow population. On the y-axis, in each case, is standardized introgressed ancestry simply because the mean and variance of minor parent ancestry in these two cases are, are relatively different from one another. So what we see in the baboons, echoing the case um, reported for uh, humans, is that Anubis minor parent ancestry is reduced in regions of the genome that exhibit more fixed differences between the parental taxa. In addition, if we calculate B-value statistics for baboons specifically, basically a, a measure of um, the likelihood that a region is locally affected, affected by more linked selection, we see an increase in um, introgressed minor parent ancestry where um, there's less likelihood to be affected by linked selection. And recapitulating some work done by Molly Schumer and colleagues, we find that Anubis ancestry is also reduced in Ambicelli in regions where we estimate lower local recombination rates. In other words, um, uh, places where putative deleterious alleles and putative neutral alleles are harder to separate from one another um, over evolutionary time. In addition, because we're studying a living model, we're able to not only sample DNA, but also RNA. So we were able to ask whether there's evidence that there's particular selection against regulatory um, uh, variants in, in our population. To do this, we drew on RNA-seq data for about 145 individuals in our population for whom we also had whole genome resequencing data and used local ancestry calls for those individuals to ask whether we could identify genes where the level of activity of the gene, the level of gene expression, was correlated by, with local ancestry at that region. We find about 2,000 such genes in the genome allowing us to look at a distribution of local ancestry EQTL effect sizes and compare effect sizes that are large, where whether you are locally Anubis or locally yellow seems to matter to the amount of gene activity, to those regions that basically have a, a, an effect size that is indistinguishable from zero, very small effect sizes. If we compare those two extremes, largest and smallest, what we find is that um, the largest and smallest effect size genes show a greater difference in minor parent ancestry, in Anubis ancestry, um, compared to if you just sort of take the, the top half and the bottom half. So in other words, Anubis ancestry is depleted in regions where we have large effect size um, local ancestry QTL. And this is consistent with an overall pattern that has also been described um, for the human case where we see a de depletion of minor parent ancestry in promoters and putative enhancer regions in our population. Um, in a complementary analysis, we can also ask again about the correlation between local recombination rate and minor parent ancestry. Um, again, segregating our data by whether there's a large effect local ancestry EQTL or basically tests for EQTL with zero effect size. And we see a stronger relationship between local recombination rate and Anubis ancestry in those large effect EQTL regions. So together, all of this suggests that there is, from the genomic data, evidence for selection against completely free gene flow. That despite the fact that the hybrids in our population do not just seem to be sort of falling down dead and we have no evidence that there are strong barriers um, to reproduction, that there are subtle barriers that we aren't picking up in the phenotypic analyses that we've done to date, but that look, at least on a qualitative level, similar to what's been described in our own species. So I think that's just sort of a cautionary tale that when you only have genome sequence data, you actually can't say a whole lot about what that looks like in practice. But it also, of course, poses a puzzle for us, which is, you know, what are these potential barriers? 
Um, one potential uh, reproductive isolating barrier happens to, has to do with what happens before individuals mate with each other, prezygotic isolating barriers. And one way that it might be possible to see the signature of prezygotic isolating barriers by ancestry in the genome is to look for correlations in local ancestry um, between regions of the genome where those correlations can't simply be explained by physical linkage, by co-inheritance from one generation to the next. So this was something Ariel Fogel, my student, was interested in doing. Basically, what she was looking for were regions of the genome on two um, separate chromosomes, so physically unlinked regions, where we saw an enrichment for shared ancestry at two loci on these two different chromosomes and depletion of mismatched ancestry or partially mis mismatched ancestry. Um, some of you may be aware that this is the type of signature that's also compatible with um, uh, dobjansky muller incompatibilities, so post-zygotic incompatibilities that select against mismatched um, genotypes. And the sort of scans for this kind of stuff have focused primarily on post-zygotic incompatibilities. But in principle, if those regions of the genome are involved in ancestry-related selection of mates, you can also see this kind of pattern. So what Ariel did was calculate partial, uh, pairwise partial co correlations between highly ancestry-informative markers in the genome, and then just take the very extreme um, sets of pairs to look at further. And then the question was, given that we have extensive data on who actually did mate with each other and who actually didn't mate with each other, whether um, those ancestry-correlated pairs, those long-range long um, interchromosomal linkage disequilibrium patterns could be explained by assortative mating. So here we're simply asking about the outcome of whether a male baboon and a female baboon mated, given the opportunity for them to mate in a female's estrus cycle um, as a consequence of a whole bunch of other things that we already know impact the likelihood of mating, like dominance, rank effects, and group demography, as well as ancestry can't combination at each locus pair in turn. So we're doing a whole bunch of these tests just swapping out the ancestry combinations at locus pairs that have this interchromosomal linkage disequilibrium pattern. So in other words, what we're asking is whether two individuals who have the potential of mating are in fact more likely to mate if they have matched genotypes at these particular loci versus if they again have partially mismatched or wholly mismatched genotypes at these loci. What we find is evidence at a 10% false discovery rate for about 92 locus pairs in which we get significant prediction of mating behavior. And if we calculate a global metric of ancestry based only on those particular pairs of the genome, we find that a model that incorporates global ancestry in an assorted of mating index significantly improves over a model that just uses overall genome-wide ancestry or morphological indicators of ancestry for that matter. Further, if we ask specifically about the variants that compose those locus pairs, we can ask about um, the level of introgression at those particular local regions of the genome. So here are randomly drawn sets across the genome. These are those extreme interchromosomal LD pairs that we tested in the assortative mating analysis, and these are those mating-associated pairs. So in other words, the regions of the genome that surround these particular variants tended to be depleted for a nubis baboon ancestry in the background of this primarily yellow baboon population. While we were doing this work, um, Graham Koop um, and his students Carl Vela and Pavitra Muralitar were doing a completely independent analysis of the potential for assortative mating to accelerate selection against introgression um, in natural populations. They have a preprint up on BioArchive, so if you're interested in this, I would really refer you to what they've done. But um, in essence, what they pointed out is that in a situation with assortative mating, what that will do is increase what they call ancestry bundling or variants in minor parent ancestry across individuals in the genome. And that potentiates, it makes more efficient selection against an introgressed um, ancestry, assuming that there are costs to that introgressed ancestry to begin with. What was particularly nice was that then they took our estimate of um, of correlations in ancestry between male and female baboons and ambicelli, and estimated that if, in fact, Anubis ancestry is deleterious, then our estimate of the ancestry correlation among mated pairs, about an R of 0.2, tran would translate to about a 20 to 24 percent increase in the rate at which Anubis ancestry was purged due to this increased variance in minor parent ancestry. <laughs> 
So this was pretty cool, but of course it actually raises another challenge, which is to show beyond the sort of signatures observed in the genome that Anubis ancestry is deleterious to begin with in our population. And here, this is the last thing I'll tell you about, Ariel turned to ask about post-zygotic isolation um, in our population, particularly as it might affect early life survival. So here I'm showing you um, the, from, from our data in Ambicelli, the probability density of age at death as a function of baboon age, and you can see this big spike early in life, which corresponds to elevated early life mortality. So just for context, um, a baboon baby is about, has about a 60% chance of making it to age four, which is approximately the earliest age of reproductive maturation. So this is a strong selective sieve for animals in, in the baboon population. Ariel was able to identify 877 mother-offspring pairs in which we had whole genome resequencing data for the mother and ask whether her um, ancestry was a predictor of whether or not her offspring were likely to survive. And this is what we find. It's actually those individuals who have the most mixed, the most intermediate genome-wide ancestry who seem to have the lowest survival probability for their offspring in making it through those first um, few years of life. This translates to an approximately six to 7% cost to survivorship, or about one out of every 14 offspring, um, which on one hand could be a significant selective pressure, and on the other hand makes us feel better because it's not something that is so obvious that it would necessarily jump out to you when watching um, a natural population in action. We have a preliminary hypothesis that this cost to those intermediate ancestry hybrids has to do with the condition of their mothers in the years prior to death. The reason is because baby baboons can die for a number of reasons. One is if their mother dies in early life, baby baboons are very dependent on their mothers for both nutritional and social resources. But in our um, analysis, we eliminated any case where mothers died before their kids. So another possibility is that the death of the kid is actually a proxy, a harbinger, of a, of a female mother's own condition. And so to ask whether those intermediate ancestry females were simply in Worth's condition, we did an analysis where we asked about the probability that those babies survive from birth to age two as a function of whether their mothers survived or not in the period when those kids would have been two to four years old. Our prediction is if this, if this explains the potential cost to meet intermediate ancestry, is that this would be true, that, mo that mother's death um, at ages two to four would explain kid mortality specifically for intermediate ancestry mothers. And that's in fact what we find. So for intermediate ancestry mothers, um, mothers who died in when that offspring would have been uh, two to four years old were much less likely to survive those first years of life. So in sum, we're starting to put together a complex picture where we need to integrate both field data that gives us phenotypic information about what hybrid baboons are actually doing compared um, to their counterparts with uh, the genetic data that tell us first how to identify who's hybrid and what their genome looks like with the field data that tells us that those um, differences are phenotypically important. And then critically, the genomic data have given us time resolution into things that happened before the onset of long-term observations. And I think this is going to be crucial for primate field studies because even the longest running primate field studies only goes back 50 or 60 years. And a lot of things, of course, happen before that time. They're also starting to give us maybe some answers to the puzzle of why primates hybridize um, quite often in nature, and yet we see tremendous taxonomic and genetic and phenotypic diversity maintained nevertheless. In our case, we think a complex combination of both prezygotic isolating barriers that influence mating behavior, as well as postzygotic um, barriers that may influence a crucial selective sieve um, in the lifespans of these animals. Um, so with that, oops. I don't know what just happened, but I'll thank you guys and all of the people involved in this project, as well as uh, Ariel and Taris, who were the trainees that led this project. And I'll just put in a brief plug um, that uh, I just moved to um, the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig, and I'm very much interested in recruiting people who have an interest in combining genetic and genomic data with phenotypic data from really cool, wild populations of primates and other social mammals. Thanks.